Welcome back to the Lantern Roo Cycling Podcast for the Paru Bay Hell of the North preview, both the men and women's race. We've got the women's race, Paru Bay Famavec Swift on Saturday. I think there's an amateur race on the Friday, warming up for the men's race on Sunday. Weather is supposed to be reasonable, not cyclonic or horrific 2021 autumn conditions wind direction i'm not so sure we're going to go through the start list of both races and then analyze the parkour and how we see the race playing out in the different phases got an early morning recording it's all happening <laughs> here um so you know how i am in the early mornings but yeah it's 29 cobble sectors for the men's race it is Still, as usual, 100Ks are flat before the first cobbled sector. Then it gradually builds in intensity with a few two and three and four star sectors before Danin. And then it really could kick off at the True Aramberg, the first five star sector, before moving into back to back to back hard four and five star sectors like Mons en Pavel, like Carrefour de Labre later in the race, or Havlouis Awaleurs before the famous finish in the velodrome in Roubaix. It doesn't even start in Paris. But, yeah, where do you – I mean, how do you see the the profile and the parkour, Benji? Where do you see the main phases of this race? Well, first of all, the breakaway formation will be interesting. We'll talk about that in a bit after we go through the riders and see which riders would like to actually get riders forward in the first place. Not only the teams that are, like, favorites will want satellite riders in the breakaway, but also teams like Bingle, who will want a rider in the breakaway just to have an opportunity to show themselves. But after that, the pre-Aremberg phase, which is like the build-up towards Aremberg, Aremberg itself where the start kicks off, and then it's one after the other anticipation until we see a favorite move somewhere between sector 17 and 12 is where I guess the first attack of a big favorite will come, unless they do it earlier, because let's be honest about it. They kind of surprise us these days, how early some riders are attacking. Van der Poel on, on uh, E3 was a very early attack on the time bed already. So can we see that move happening on on the Forest of Valair through it item bed already? Who knows? will be difficult, but I'd love to see it. That's for sure. And obviously, the sprint at the Velodrome is going to be a, an interesting thing, unless it's not a sprint if it's a solo rider. But first of all, will you be watching the entire race? I will be. Remember last year when Dylan Van Bala won, Ineos kicked it off really, really early. They There was crosswinds on the flat section. They took advantage of that with Ghana, who's back here this year. Dylan Van Bala's changed over to Jumbo Visma, one of their big rivals for the race. And so this is a race you've got to be watching wall to wall. You never know what could happen. Van der Poel likes to fall asleep sometimes at the start of these races. Well, Van Aert was caught out last year too. And if you're the best place to watch the entire race with pre and post game show is GCN plus and G and LRCP listeners can get a 15% discount on an annual GCN plus subscription in certain territories. You can bring, you can watch every unmissable moment from the biggest races like Paris Bay. And it's good value because a month exactly today, the Giro d'Italia starts stage one, which we'll obviously be covering, but GCN Plus has wall-to-wall coverage of every stage that you can watch on demand or on delay. So thanks to GCN Plus for supporting LRCP. But the start list, well, if I know it's another favorite for a mon- monument. He's been a favorite for a lot of <laughs> monuments. He's narrow favorite, as I see it now, ahead of Van der Poel in the betting. Pedersen is third. At $7, Ganner's fourth, close behind in the top five favorites at $8. Van Bala fifth, another Yumbo Visma rider. He's back in after sickness. Laporte sixth, then Morich seventh, Asgren eighth, Kung ninth, and Lampart tenth, all in the $20 to $25 range. So sort of four to six percent chance for those guys. Arno de Lee given a chance as well as the Seneschal for Mesh is at 50s. Hmm, interesting. I'm looking for my man. Van Kier's book. He's like my favorite writer. I won't even be watching. He's not even listed, so that's a disgrace. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm not searching properly. If I just, but if I type in Van, it brings up 30 results. <laughs> so um, that doesn't work anyway. But yeah, Jumbo Visma Benji Van Bala in. I think they sorely missed him in Tour of Flanders. They got a Fini yeah. Van Aert, Van Bala Rosen, uh, Van Hoydonk Laporte, Tim Van Dyke. It's 
I think four four strong co leaders and then the supporting riders of Van Dyke, Rosen and Afini. Yes, but I do think there's still some hierarchy in in that team itself. I, I would expect Van Hoordonk to fall into a Domus T role earlier than the other riders on that list, and then Laporte will be the next one. And Wout van Aden and Van Bala, I see higher as those other two. Van Bala, who won last year, obviously, after rolling attacks with Turner in the last, well, last 50 kilometers, roughly, when he rode away. But the thing with that team is, Wout van Aden and Van Bala, they're very different characters, eh? As in... Van Bala, we know, is the anticipation monster. He's that rider that subtly rides away. You're like, oh, we'll catch him. Then he gets into a group. Then he drops everybody in that group. And you never see him again. That's Van Bala. Or you got a situation where you do see him again, and he's getting a top three or a top five in the race, regardless, just because of that anticipation. And Van Aad is the rider that everybody will be looking at. Van der Poel will be looking at Van Aad. Pedersen will be looking at Van Aad. But the question then is, Van Baal has done this so many times. He's done it at World Championships in Flanders. RVV last year, for example. Rubel last year, he got away because Van Aert and Van Der Poel were looking at each other. But will that happen again? That Van Baal is able to ride away because the other favorites are looking at each other? Or do you think they will actually start closing down Van Baal? Because I'm actually not sure. I think it's even harder to close him down now because last mm-hmm. year he was doing it and there wasn't... There, yeah, there was Ben Turner in the group, I grant you, but there wasn't Tom Bonin or someone on Ineos marking the moves. And so, yeah, he's going to theoretically have Jumbo Visma teammates disrupting the chase or demoralizing the chase behind. So that's, if Flanders, if he was there, I would have expected him to have been in that group in the Molenberg and anticipating with Pedersen afterwards. So, but then again, he might not be in top shape, like, who knows, 260Ks after you've been crook. Uh, I don't know. Laporte's a big one too. I think this race yeah. suits him more than Tour of Flanders where he just simply cannot go, even for one climb, the pace of Van der Poel and Pagacha on like Quarmont and the flatter road suit him here. And to speak of Van der Poel, he brings a pretty strong team actually for Roubaix. They've brought in Groves, at least on the indicative PCS start list, and Philipson, who just won Shelter Price. Groves just won Limburg Classic in impressive fashion, not in a sprint. they got Dillier, who came second to Sagan, or Gilbert, I can't remember. And Sagan, I think, Jani Vermeersch, Samuel Gaze, and Goggle. It's a pretty strong team, Benji, but it's all centered. It's very different to the Yumbo one. It's all yeah. centered around protecting Varnapool. And yeah, there's not too much more to say about their tactics. I think the clear the clear matchup to me is Yumbo need to expose Varnapool and exploit him being isolated unless someone like Dillier or Vermeersch have an absolute world day if they can if he has one rider still with him with like 50 40 k's to go then he has a real chance but if he's isolated completely after arenberg he cannot respond to anticipations on the flat roads or the tarmac roads exactly and also the question that comes to mind when it comes to alperson for me is and of course when it comes to yombo visma as well is you're talking about Adam Bergen being isolated after Adam Bergen so forth, and on Adam Bergen, probably not yet. But are there ways for Alperson to make sure that he's not isolated after Adam Bergen? Then I'm looking at the early breakaway formation, and that's a phase that in Roubaix is super important, right? From all the classics, it's probably the most important classic where the breakaway formation matters. Because so many people want to be in the breakaway. It's not just the riders like Van Kersburg, your boy, at at bingo, he's going to want to be in the breakaway or will want to anticipate at some point in the race to be ahead of the favorites so he doesn't get destroyed once they attack from in the group that he's in. And a breakaway is an opportunity for that. So that type of rider, Walshide at Cofidis, for example, Frison at Lotto, those are the type of riders I'm looking at to anticipate in early moves. But when it comes to Alperson, can they send someone forward like they did with Philipson one, two years ago once again and therefore make it easier between brackets for Vanderpool. Yeah, if I was Alperson, having a guy in the break like Delia who can go all day is really important, particularly even Gay, like all those riders, to be honest, 
yeah. all of them should be trying to get in the breakaway, and all of them are guys who could go deep into the race. And Philipson, I'm pretty sure I picked to win or something <laughs> last yeah. year. Uh, <laughs> Philipson's in great shape, obviously. Groves too. They're not just basic co- cookie cutter sprinters. And same goes for Quick Step. We'll move to them now. With I think Tim Merlier going. We'll have Castle Pedersen coming in, who hasn't done a lot of the other classics. Ballerini. Seneschal, Lampard, big race for him. Kasper Askren, obviously, probably their theoretical leader, but I think Lampard is on his status within the yeah. team. I think Merlier in the break can go really far in this race based on how yeah. he rode at Tour of Flanders. I think so as well. And Quickstep will want to anticipate as well, whether it's in the breakaway formation phase or the phase later, maybe after Adam Beric sends someone in the break as well. In a break, not the early break, of course. Or in the early couple sectors after Arenberg make a move like that. Because I recall that Gilbert attacked in the first two sectors after Arenberg in the year he won and stayed ahead with Lampard marking Sagan, who was trying to close down the gap towards a group of Gilbert that year. And there's just so many early moves that get you somewhere in this race. Heyman won it from the early breakaway. Vermeers and Delier podiumed from the early breakaway. Oz was a teammate that was sent forward for BMC in the year that Greg van Avermaet won as a satellite rider. So for Quickstep, this is the ideal scenario to, as an outsider, because they're not the favorites anymore, even though Osgreen on flatter terrain, I'd rage, unless they have punctures like, like Osgreen has oh, had yeah. Didn't a lot of bad run luck, a right? Special tire system one year. Luke will confirm he's all, Luke is like our producer. The guy's got a thing for tires. He's watching tires. <laughs> he knows what everyone's doing. He knows who's got the marker out, putting the, hiding what tires they had. It'll let us know. Apparently, one of Ineos or there's not a plug, obviously. Continental have like TLR tires or something. And there's another version. And teams have been marking out which version they're using, I think, like not to give away which version yeah. of the tires they're using, TT or SDR, UAE and Ineos. Yeah. Uh, so he's all the tire stuff is Roubaix. All the tire freaks, <laughs> Luke, you're a tire freak. I think James Swan probably watching and Ronan McLaughlin too. This is their race. They, they love the special tech. I think Yumbo are using and DSM those, um, the, the system which, you can adjust through your shifters the pressure of your tires and it can reinflate and deflate your tires on demand uh, before and after cobble sectors. Obviously, you want less pressure in the cobble sectors. Yeah. You want higher pressure on the the tarmac roads afterwards. Apparently, it does save watts. Uh, DSM riders refused to use it last year. I can't wait for this to be a disaster for Yumbo and Van Aert <laughs> to be on Arenberg holding up his tires. <laughs> Guys, real again. Yeah, like last year they had plenty of bad luck when it comes to their wheels breaking, but I do find interest in this new technology, as in, in my head, it's logical, no, that if you can adjust your pressure throughout the race, which is probably an extra skill you need to keep in your mind, because is it, like, if it's on your wheel, do you need to use it? Can you just skip it if you want to? Because then, if you're not yeah, you comfortable, don't have to use it. you can just skip it. So that that's the good part of it. But it can probably give an advantage because on paper, you should be able to go faster outside of the cobble sectors if you can reinflate your tires. And maybe in the sprint, it might matter. Exactly. No? You finish the last cobble sector, you bump your tires up 30 PSI or 25 yeah. PSI, and then you, you're sprinting not on a tire that's sagging because you've just <laughs> done, you know, and also every cobble sector, you probably, you're losing pressure. Because yeah. you're smashing through the cobbles. So guys are probably usually sprinting on like one bar in the, in the <laughs> yeah. velodrome and you can bump that up if it works. Now, if it yeah. catastrophically fails. It'll be funny. <laughs> it's not going to be good. I don't know. But can't wait to find out. Um, maybe John Cole, he'll be using it as well as Van Aert. So we'll see those two in the velodrome, I'm sure. Anyway, Ineos, they don't have... Dylan Van Baal, who won last year, but they do have Josh Tarling, I believe, who's doing this race. He was originally a reserve, but Ben Turner, really disappointing. He's now crashed badly twice. He just came back from injury for the recent classics, and he's just broken his arm again, I think, and he's out, which is a real shame. Ganner's there clearly. The Tarling is the mini Ganner, but he's not so mini. He's like 6'5". He's a guy to put in the early break because no one will know who he is. 
and <laughs> all of a sudden it's like, oh shit. He's like, he reminds you of Florian the Mesh a little bit. Okay. In 21, you got to, like, Tarling, I know. I'm doing the thing where I go for one coffee ride with a guy and that means I pick them to win the next monument or grand tour they do. And uh, that's just how it is. You know that. Um, yeah. But I really think he'll be good in this race. Connor Swift, Sheffield. Sheffield's had crash issues consistently. Not all of his fault, but where there's smoke, there's fire, I think. Luke Rowe and Kwiatkowski, obviously experienced heads. And this is a great race for particularly Rowe as well. He'll be well up for it. Gano fourth favourite though, Benji. He's, you know, behind Vanderpool Pedersen Van Aert. Is that based on the San Remo result or why is that? I think that's based on the San Remo result, mainly. I think that might be too high for Gano, but I it wouldn't surprise me if he actually competes because I feel like in the in the Cobble Classics he was on point, but every time the hills were what killed him. And I remember last year where he was in that first group that launched in the early echelon moments of the race and on the first cobble sectors, he looked very strong on the cobble sectors. He flew back off his first puncture and then he had another puncture, I'm pretty sure. And those punctures are really what ruined his race. So I would have liked seeing last year's race where we see a scenario where Ghana doesn't have those punctures and see where he actually lands. That being said, putting him as full favored, that's a bit high in my head. I feel like there's other riders in this race where... Above Chef and Kung. And Von Bala as well, right? Yeah. Because there's a real scenario that Von Bala does his Von Bala thing and Von Bala's away into, into Von Bala land. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't know how to finish that sentence. Anyway, well, yeah, like, I agree. The classic thing is Van Bala going ahead with like Frederick Frison. A lot of were like, ah, oh, we're represented. He goes to Fred Wright. And then he just... He, just, we did, he went with Moritz and Devrint last year. <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden, oh... No, he anticipated across their move. And then he just drops them like he did an envelope. Yep. I mean, I think it's also, as you said, Ganner was good in E3. He came 10th, but he wasn't close to being like he came back. But there's no hills here. I question his positioning. That's yep. the big question mark is can he, you know, position consistently? I think the fact that Ineos blew apart the race and stayed at the front last year as much as possible in a reduced group for the whole of the first third of the cobble sectors was a big positive for him. They're not, I hope they do. Uh, it'd be great, but I don't think they're going to be able yeah. to do that again this year. I remember the Montalcino stage in the Giro dad. Was it the one that Schmidt won where Emco and Almeida were fighting each other, not physically, but mentally. And Gena was the one that opened to race with Bernal in the wheel in the Peloton. Can we compare e that? Either that or Campo Felice um, in the Giro 21. Yeah, I mean, no, I'm not comparing it. He's there. He's, <laughs> he's got a position against 55 kilo Androni riders like, um, <laughs> <laughs> what's his name? Um, I can't remember. But yeah, no, not now. I think positioning Cepeda. question mark. Cepeda, yeah. <laughs> He's got a bully Cepeda for position. Here you got a bully Sepp Van Mark and Guillaume Van Kersbroek who'll put you in the gutter and say, I don't care who you are, uh, which is too right. But listen, if he makes it deep into the race and starts burring, doing the Ghana noises and 700 watts on the flat in the saddle, serious rider, my concern is who's he going to have with him deep in the final? Don't forget, yeah. Van Bala had Turner with him. Like, Turner being out is such a big blow because he was in the group of 10 last year with Van Bala. I think we need to talk about one more rider before we get to the group dynamics for a second. We've spoken about Wout van Aert and his team. We've spoken about Alperson and Van der Poel, but there's this fan favorite we keep mentioning, but we haven't discussed his team too much, which is Mes Pedersen at Trek Segafredo, where Steven's in this team. He's got support with the likes of Kirsch and so forth in that squad. A pretty solid team for this race. I'm going to say it again. I've said it numerous times. Mes Pedersen, two years ago, the rainy Roubaix. If Ro doesn't take him out, he wins that Roubaix. I truly believe that is the case. In my head, that makes so much sense. He looked so good. In the rain, he gets 50 watts bonus. Even without the rain, he should be really strong in this race. And I put him next to Wout van Aert and Van der Poel. And he could even benefit from Van der Poel and Wout van Aert being in a group together. But 
who can also benefit is again, uh, for example, we get to a group, we're like in the final phase of the race, six riders in a group or something, the likes of Kung, Peterson, Van der Poel, Wout van Aert, Mohoric, and let's say, I don't know, Asgreen or Polid or whatever. Now, what will happen? You will see the Kungs of the world, the Gunners of the world, the Polits of the world, the Asgreens of the world, roll attacks on the three sprinters, right? Because they don't want to go to the velodrome with those riders. And they also know if we hammer it on the cobble sector, we likely won't make the difference against Wout van Aert and Van der Poel, right? Yeah, my concern for Pedersen, mm -hmm. he's played his hand, I think. He was too strong at Flanders. And I don't think he's going to have the license to anticipate early. And the only way he can do that is if his team works really well. And listen, they got Dan Ola in the break last week at Flanders. He went across to that move, and that was really important to pull in that group one for when Pedersen bridged across. But will Sturven play sort of a role supporting Pedersen in an efficient way where, say, Van Bala anticipates, anticipates. Sturven has to go with that and sit yeah. on, not contribute. And then you have Pedersen sitting in the wheels being brought back behind. I'm, I've not seen them do it that well. Kirsch is very strong. Turns just was good in shoulder price. Dan Hula was strong in Flanders. But can they put it together? And will Pedersen be isolated in the final? Mm, and I think he probably will be. Does he need to be the guy that anticipates to win that part? I don't think so. He can still no. do the same thing as Van der Poel and Wout van Aert and still win this race. But I agree. Then he will likely be isolated and he will get rolled attacks by other riders. And what if Jan Bos with two riders in that group? Van Bala and Wout van Aert. And Van Bala and Wout van Aert will probably roll attacks on that group. No? Like, Wout van Aert will probably yeah. be the sprinty guy, but... They both have to roll attacks for Van Bala to probably get away or... And depends. also, like, Pedersen just beat Van Aert in the sprint at Tour of Flanders after being in the break for 90 kilometers and being solo for 25 kilometers. So yeah. you're not going to want to go to the finish with him if you want to maximize your chances. They're the main contenders, outsiders who have a real chance, who will be relevant in this race. If he can ride is Morric. Right will be good as usual. Watch out for Dusan Rajevic in the early phases. <laughs> he's, a, <laughs> he's a nightmare um, on the front, <laughs> weaving his way around. I wasn't surprised the crash came out of one of him or Massey last week. FDJ strong across the board with Aski, yeah, yeah. Watson, Stewart, Damar, Legac, and Kung. Kung will want to go with a Sturvan or someone or Van Bala and hope he can beat them he's in sort of a first tier outsider but then it drops off pretty steeply you've got your vermeers but other than the marks but then it's sort of real outsiders like oil as carno kell o'brien who i like and Guillaume van kills book on bingo al who you know is going to top 10 this race so again it looks close at the top to you know all these three pedersen van der Poel and van Aert, but it's Roubaix, anything can happen. At least in the podium, you can very easily have surprise podium results like Adelier, uh, like Vermeersh in 21 in this race and sometimes Frison. they do come from the early break. Frison. Yeah, he's in my top 10 list like Van Kersburg is on your top 10 list for this race. And those are the kind of riders we can expect to try to go in the breakaway and anticipate after automatic and so forth. But it's, it's quite a, a setup, this race, and a lot can happen. And despite luck being involved when it comes to punctures and crashes and so forth, like Wout van Aert's wheel breaking, Laporte's wheel breaking, there was probably some mechanical issue with that. But I would argue that when it comes to water riders, also the bad luck will have a consequence. But that doesn't make that you don't need to like prepare for every possible situation because if you do that, you can get somewhere. And tactics truly do matter where... It's sending riders forwards early or sending riders forward after Adenberg and so forth. Like, Adenberg is a, a sneaky one, eh? Because on one end, you see Adenberg as, as this, like, this gate to hell, but it isn't the old deciding sector in every single Urbay in the first place, right? Because before Adenberg, we go towards it with like a large peloton usually, but after Adenberg, there's, there's a straight road where it kind of settles down for a bit 
in most editions, most dry editions at least, and then they then they have opportunities to write away people. And I like those moments as well. And that's why I love Roubaix the most, because there's so many moments where people can anticipate, whether it's in the sectors after automatic, whether it's on the straight road after automatic, whether it's in the breakaway, whether it's on a sector afterwards. The one thing we know is that it's going to be a good race from start to finish, no? Yeah, you've got this phase before dinner of nine cobbled sectors. That's more the avoiding big problems phase for the top yeah. favorites. I don't expect it to really kick off there. You just don't want to have an annoying mechanical and a big chase before the real, you know, Arenberg lead out starts. Maybe you see a Jonas Ruch or Koch or Pollitt start who podium this race. Yeah. Seems like a lifetime ago. <laughs> Maybe you see them sort of anticipate here, but it won't be large groups. And then you have the Wallers, Arenberg, the double Wallers combo. Five, first five star sector being True Aid Arenberg. But as Benny said, after uh, the second Wallers, there's like 9Ks of flat tarmac. So everyone's done a big lead out. The group's been thinned and battered on Arenberg. And then you have a regroupment usually. And people come back after punctures. Uh, where's our domestiques? How many numbers do we have in the group? And that's when here you expect a Morris to jump, a Sam yeah. Watson to jump, or frankly, Jasper Sturvin should be jumping here yeah. uh, for Pedersen, I think, or Louvel from Arkea Sanzik, who are a strong team across the board too. Or anyone, all those sort of third-tier riders really who have made it into the group or second-tier even. Like Moritz will probably try here. Like, are Yumbo just going to close down Moritz immediately? I don't know. So this is where you really start to see the moves go up the road before then it goes into like the last 80 Ks of the race sectors in 18, 17, 16, 15, 14 in the lead up to Oshi where the sectors just come back to back to back. Like Tilwa comes, there's like 6 Ks almost straight of cobbles and yeah. that's where, you know, that's where in the past you might even have seen – wasn't there a lead-out for Van Aert? Where, where did Van Hooydonk do the lead-out? Was that or she Les or she later? I think that was or she Les or she, but I will say that during those sectors you just mentioned, which is like 18 to, to roughly 15-ish, not only the cobble sectors mattered, Ari, eh? because we've seen moves go away after the cobble sectors because we've got this like thing that happens where the breaks up the road, every single – lead out to the cobble sectors, the break comes a bit closer because the peloton speeds up. On the cobble sectors, it depends on whether someone actually keeps pacing on the cobble sector or does something on the cobble sector in the peloton, but the breakaway will keep on moving forward. So there's like this, this tension where it could expand the gap or could lower the gap, but the breakaway will try and keep that gap above, let's say, 35, 30 seconds. I'm guessing to make sure or to prevent that a bridge from the back seems a plausible scenario or a plausible strategy for behind. So they're kind of preventing the peloton from thinking, I can bridge that gap at this point, I think. So then we get over that cobble sector, and we've got this moment of the peloton looking at each other, okay, who's actually going to keep riding on the asphalt now? And that's where moves from the peloton might be most effective, because that's where the, I see the anticipation being more valuable than on the cobble sector itself. Is that a valuable take? Yeah, I think, I mean, aren't Yumbo really going to dictate this race? Like, they should, but... If you have a group with Van Aert, Pedersen and Van Der Poel, and you have Van Bala, Laporte, and Van Hooydonk in this phase, and Van Der Poel has no teammates, Pedersen, Sturvin's not had a good classics campaign so far. This is why you the the softening up earlier then really impacts this phase from like 17 cobbled sector 17 to 13 where you can have realistically you could have three or four yumbo they'll be hoping yeah, and but... isolated leaders and that's where you have to start to move with those guys and put those guys under pressure between the cobbled sectors um agree i think van art just with teammates in the group getting them to do a lead out for 50 k's to go and then trying to drop Pedersen and Van Der Poel on a cobble sector is not the way to go. Um, <laughs> exactly. You want to try and get your teammates forward so that the others have to chase them, and that scenario would be the most plausible for Van Aert. And even if they can't chase them, if it's a Van Bale, 
Devon Barlow might en- actually end up winning the race because we've seen that scenario happen before for Van Barla in the past. But the 17 to 13 is also the kind of phase where whether it's on Oshiles or she or another Oshi section, we see a favorite doing their first move. And maybe 2023 is a year where, just like in many of the races we see these days, they go earlier. They go on through it automatic funded pool because he thinks, okay, if I hammer it now, we might not have as many cobbled domestiques for Van Aert after this sector. It's a possibility, but I don't necessarily expect it. I expect that first move to come 17 to 13 phase. And afterwards, we'll have like the scenario where the favorites fight mano a mano behind while they might have riders ahead in the groups ahead or the breakaway is still ahead. That kind of scenario, that seems the most plausible, right? Between sector 17 and even towards sector four where that entire scenario plays out. Yeah, I don't see I don't see the favorites dropping each other here. It's still too early in the race. And if you're Vanderpool, you you're opening yourself up to having a pace with Pedersen or Van Aert in the wheel. Yeah. So yeah, I think this is where teams will try and play numbers and a really and where maybe like a counter move with Sturvan, Asgren, Van Bala goes. So yeah, I can't watch wait to watch. There's obviously the Velodrome <laughs> sprint. I don't think there'll be one for first place Ooh. at least. Uh obviously Bernard won the sprint for second last year against Kung. I think uh it's time for predictions, Benji. Uh I yes. I don't think it will be that open a race early compared to last year. Last year will be hard to replicate with what Ineos did in the crosswinds. You never know, never say never. I do think it will be a chaotic race early, though. It was still a large peloton that entered Arenberg last year. Obviously, punctures and equipment and you know collapsing or failing on you can really change the race drastically if you have to chase. But yeah, I'm going for a Dylan Van Bala solo win. And uh, Wout Van Aert second, and Pedersen... No, and Stefan Kung third, sorry. For me, I've said this week a lot of names. I've said that Wout Van Aert is on paper the favorite for me with the team that he has, because I believe that on the flat, he should have more strength than with Aldequarum on the Baterberg. So we should be able to follow Van der Poel on these flat cobble sectors. But that being said, I don't necessarily see him winning, which is like... He's a favorite, but he won't be winning. <laughs> Shots against each other. Peterson, I would like to win because I feel like he got robbed that one year in the rain. Obviously, not on purpose, but he got robbed. And then last year, he crashed early, so I didn't get to see my prediction play out that Peterson would win the race. So I kind of want to shout Peterson. But it wouldn't surprise me if we have the scenario where a group of six of favorites is what we see with the likes of Wout van Aert, Van der Poel, um, Peterson and even a, a potential Ghana and so forth still in the group, a potential Kung still in the group. And then there's a scenario possible where a Kung rides away or something. But I feel like Kung hasn't had his timing right when it comes to his attacks from these groups recently. Ever. <laughs> Ever, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he rides with When's them anyway. When's Kung ever gone solo in a race? <laughs> He's tried, I think, a few times. Didn't he try it in the end that he can wave him with Nathan and Hoyden to, to train them back? Mm, yeah, maybe. Yeah, Peterson wins yeah. again. Oh, that was Fuck really it. late. I mean, like in the mid phase of the race. I've never seen the guy yeah. go solo. Um, he's Peterson usually wins. chasing down moves for other people. Peterson wins. Frison gets fourth. <laughs> <laughs> but no podium. Yeah, I think um, I think Van Bala is going to win solo. I think. Watching Flanders, I think Matthew Van der Poel is perfectly happy to lose a race as long as he doesn't tow Van Aert in the wheel. Like, yeah, I think you might see a peculiar situation where Van der Poel is up the road. No, we're sorry, where Van Bala is up the road, 30, 40 seconds in the last 20 Ks. It's just Van Aert and Van der Poel behind, and Van der Poel literally doesn't pull. Really? Nah. Yeah. I, I, that I don't believe. <laughs> I, think, I think he just like gives up. I I, I <laughs> fail to recognize that proposition. <laughs> I reckon he's like, I'm not telling you. <laughs> yeah. It, it's but possible, but I don't wins. see it. Sucks for Van Aert. Well, I let's be honest about it. 
Peterson will be there anyway, and then it will defeat everybody on the finish line. True. That's what I just said. But also, fellow drum, let's talk about it for a second. I texted you this morning when I woke up, Mister Sir Lantern Rouge of the House Quokka. Is there wind in the velodrome, and does wind matter in the velodrome? I mean, it's a circle, so it all evens <laughs> out, and they got to do it twice. Or maybe they, where they enter it, no, they do it one and a half times, so maybe yeah, it doesn't but matter. Doesn't it matter when they launch a sprint in headwind and tailwind? If you open it up on the back before this final straight, yeah, too early yeah. on the front, most of the time it's a bad idea anyway. If it's a headwind, it's a terrible idea. Usually second position is best. Uh, not where Bone. I mean, Bone didn't know that. Australians know that. <laughs> So I don't really feel the need to talk about velodrome positioning because Australians know, Belgians don't. Tom well, clearly Bowen. I asked and I'm Belgian, so I clearly didn't <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> he didn't know. He got boxed in. Yeah. Sorry, buddy. Better luck next time. Um, anyway, can't wait to watch Power Bay. GCM Place Plus is the best place to do it. On to Power Bay, Fam, Avec, Zwift. Now 146Ks. They don't have the Arenberg section because... ASO said, and I agree with this. If they have, if they had it, they would have it because they start in Denain, closer to Roubaix, because it's a shorter race. If they had it, it would be literally the full peloton doing Arenberg, and they'd be doing yep. it in the first hour of the race or something. And it would just be, it's just first of all, it decreases the ten- tension in the race. It'd be like the first stage of the Tour de France Fameberg Swift having the Tourmalet. At the right at the start out well, of neutral, Van Vluten. I mean, they kind of do this year. <laughs> and Van Vluten just goes and wins the race. Boring. So, yeah, they have, they start with eight, they have 18 sectors. They do the Orchis combo as their sort of their first uh, hard sectors, then Monson Pavel, then Canfan Pavel later. Uh, and the final is exactly the same uh, with Grison, Cafford, Labra, et cetera, uh, paired together before the finish in the velodrome. And even without Arenberg, it's selective enough anyway. This race is chaotic. We've had solo winners last the last two editions with Diagnan, controversial league, Lizzie Diagnan, and Elisa Longaborghini winning solo. So I think the route is fine. Yep, I think the route is fine as well. It's definitely a hard race. And you mentioned those last two years, but let's like in-depthly look at how the scenarios played out. Diagnan attacked in the rainy edition, one of the first cobble sectors, and everybody behind nearly crashed. So basically, they didn't have the domestiques to then keep the gap and make sure that Dignan doesn't doesn't fly off into the distance. So Dignan was benefiting from the strategy of going very early in the race, which is a good choice because she ended up winning the race as a consequence. Longo Wargini benefited from his D-Works being absolute shit when it comes to tactics last year. And that's because they responded to Longo Wargini with Cicchini, the rider that, let's be honest about it, is going to get dropped by Longo Wargini in the follow-up after that. And that is exactly what happened. And then Kopecky was working for Vandenbroek Black, even though everybody knew that Kopecky was the strongest rider in the first place. Kopecky was in a move earlier and wasn't allowed to work in that move by SD Work. So they realized too late that Kopecky was their strongest rider and they lost the race as a consequence. Longo Borghini won and congrats to Trek for doing it two years in a row. But SD Works has been better this year when it comes to tactics. It's important to note before we go further no Ellen van Dijk with Trek because maternity leave. No van den Broek Black with SD Works because maternity leave. And Guazzini for Groupama had a pelvic fracture in the recon the last few days. So that's a bit of a bummer for Groupama. No, not Groupama. FDG, sorry. Oh, God. Oh, God. We just came out of the men's preview. Oh, God. It's FDG uh, Suez, of course. So, um, yeah, we see those scenarios. And I look at the parkour this year and I see it's raining right now. We're on, is it Thursday today? It's Thursday today. It's raining right now. Tomorrow, there's rain supposedly forecasted as well. Will the cobble still be wet? That's a very good question that every single year I ask myself in the run into Roubaix. I think that some of them might be. And will an early move not pay off again then? Because I feel like early moves are really the way to go in women's Roubaix at this point. I think that's unfortunately what might happen if you want tension in the race the number one favorite i haven't seen any betting market for this race but i don't know what what i would price her at probably a dollar 25 um if like 
that's probably I probably never have <laughs> his punctures could have that's so short. But a lot of Kopecky, it begins and ends with her how this race will uh, play out and SD works. They've obviously got I don't think Royster is doing this race, but they'll have Chikini again. They will have uh, Majerus. Vibis? I don't know if Guarishi will do it. Vibers as well. Vollering, I assume, will do the race as well. But and maybe Misha Bredevolt, who just uh, won Volta Limburg Classic, so she might be a domestique. But I think Kopecky, first of all, you just correctly, Benji, went through how she should have won last year or was, should have had a better chance to win. Strada Bianca yeah. is fresh in the mind. We see her the way she rode Tour of Flanders. I think she's going to go early, probably on... Or she lives or she at the latest, or Monson Pavel at the latest, 46 Ks to go from the finish, maybe even earlier. But I think Monson Pavel at the absolute latest, yeah. Pecky goes. She does not want someone else to win. That includes her own team. She wants to win this race. And that's why she's going to go early. And she's going to work with someone from another team in the wheel, even if she has teammates behind. And she's going to yeah. drop them. And she's going to yeah. win. I think that's a very plausible scenario, but for the sakes of this preview, let's consider chances for other riders as well. And our teammates are the first ones to pop in mind as well, but I would have expected a Royster to be at this race for the reason that, obviously, she probably wants to do well at Hill Classics, but when it comes to Bay, I feel like she has the opportunity of going early Kent Wevelham style and therefore benefiting from the scenario of having Kopecky in the team. But I agree, Kopecky wouldn't probably doesn't want that internally. She wants to win Roubaix more than Flanders. After Flanders, she was she was happy, but she said, I, I, I would prefer to win Roubaix. <laughs> Which, as a as a Flemish person, heresy. But in reality, it's a better race. Sorry to our Flanders. Um, I think... I think she probably wants to create a scenario for herself, like you say, Kopecky, where a Royster can't. Well, it's up to her teammates, though, if they attack earlier than when she's planning to attack. And from a tactical standpoint, it's clever for SD works to roll attacks early and make sure the race is harder for the others to make sure the other leaders need to chase the not leaders from SD work. Uh, but I don't necessarily see a Weebus doing that for some reason. And maybe it's because I'm I'm so focused on sh- her riding like Hill Classics that I don't see it in my head to do it on like a flat cobble classic. But in reality, she probably can work a bit and anticipate in these type of races in the same way that uh, a Balsamo could also do so if she doesn't get disqualified this year. But um, next to SD Works, let's uh, talk about the others here. And I'll be honest, I don't really have a like clear set of ordered outsiders next to SD Works. I think Lucinda Brown will Georgie. be great. I number think one. Georgie will be great. Yeah, you're, you're probably right. Georgie would probably be number two next to Kopecky for me. Jump into it. You can say it. Well, she's probably, she's a big engine. The steep hills is where Kopecky has put a big difference into her, like in Omlope on the Moor and in Flanders. I'm not sure if she she came, she didn't have the best race. I think she had like, she was in like three crashes. So I think she's in fantastic shape, fifth in Omlope. I think the flatter parkour suits her, as well as Charlotte Cool and uh, the other riders. Jastrav. The, Jastrav's been very good. I think there is a possibility. I think DSM are going to be stronger than Trek because yeah. just Van Dyke is a huge... She She's the glue that makes it all work for Trek. Yeah, but- so I think, yeah, Ploof, Cool, Georgie, Hangavel. Yastrab and Francisca Koch is a very, very strong team and the second strongest team at this race. I think no Royster is a big minus for SD Works if she is indeed not doing the race. And I think the way Kopecky's going to ride exposes her a little bit. If if Georgie is good enough to go with her initial moves and then Kopecky's like, well, I do have to wait a little bit, then Yastrab can come back and call. They won't be far behind. Or maybe Kopecky just drags Georgie to a victory uh, as well. And I think the flat is where, yeah, the flat is good for her. The other, another strong team is Mackay Sierra Bianic at Movistar. Bianic had bad luck with crashes, I think, the year before. She's This is a big target yep. for her, French classic specialist. Um, 
But yeah, I really like DSM's chances. I, I don't see Balsamo or Longa Borghini Brando. able to go with uh, Kapeki. Brand got third last year, and we don't necessarily call her out for the hilly cobble classics as much, but on the flat Roubaix, True. I do believe she might be that that wild card for a trek if the focus is in Longo Borghini, that Brand can take something away in the process because she does have a bit of a sprint as well. So that can be very useful. Wasn't she with Kapeki? No, I don't Brand remember. is so good. She's been like the second strongest rider in this race, I think, last year. Uh, luck obviously can play a big part. So, yeah, maybe it depends. Like, this is the race where because of bad luck, because there's no hills, I think the way Kapeki's going to approach it is riskier than, say, Tour of Flanders where you point at the second, the last Quamont and the Paterberg and you're like, I'm just going to drop you all and then solid to the finish. <laughs> or Omloop where you look at the moor and you're like, I'm going to drop everybody and ride, ride to the finish solo, you know, if she does that early, if she isolates herself and she brings with her brand, she brings with her Georgie, and then all of her teammates are behind, she keeps riding with those riders. It'd be like Van Aert riding with Van Der Poel with 100Ks to go to the finish with his teammates just behind. Like, he shouldn't do that. And I think Kopecky will do that because she's like, I'm the best, and she's the best. But if you then flap, which you can, Yep. you lose 20, 30 seconds, then you can suddenly lose the race. So, yeah, it, to me, it doesn't feel as much of a foregone conclusion now that I think about it more as yep. Tour of Flanders because anything can happen in this race. Um, Ken Schramm, by the way, they do have a confirmed team of Shabby Cromwell, Skalniok Soika, Towers, Van Der Duen, and Basoit. I think Basoit is I'd keen to see how she goes. She's had a fantastic classics campaign so far, 22-year-old. How I'm looking for a top 10 from her. But yeah, how do you think I'm going to go with um, – I, I think they lose this race, SD Works. I think the the problems of Strada and the way Kopecky's going to ride is going to punish them in this race. Yeah, and initially I also had the feeling of like, oh, they'll they'll win easily, eh? but I don't think they'll team their team will be as as devastatingly strong on in this in the four set as it was on the Ronde van Vlaanderen because the Ronde van Vlaanderen, like you said, you've got these preset moments where attacks will happen. Here it can happen everywhere, and therefore it can also happen between sectors where they need to respond to groups that get away. And if that happens, then I'd like to see which riders they respond with to those attacks because they did with Cicchini last year to Longo Borghini and it didn't work out. Now, I will say, however, I like the way that this race is so new that we're also doubting certain riders' ability to potentially top 10 here because like Makai top 10 last year, Norsgaard top 10 after, I think, crashing the year before as well or crashing last year too. I don't remember if it was both or one of them, but... We haven't spoken about Mariana Voss, who on paper is very good on this terrain, especially on like flat cobble, cobble classics now. I believe that Mariana Voss can compete for this race. Last year, she had her COVID, right? When just before the race started, which was a real bummer for the race. But yeah. this might be the one where Voss can actually compete, knowing that the hills is what killed her in the other races recently. Exactly. It seems to be the hills are the problem for her. And her handling is, of course, not a problem. It's not she's not someone you want to take to the velodrome with you, even if you are Kapeki. And so I think Voss is going to be a problem. She was very strong in the first edition and just missed that move of Diagnon. So there's loads of I think Norsgaard's out with injury. Really? Unfortunately okay. for her. Uh Movistar's confirmed team doesn't have her in it, at least on PCS. And so yeah, we could. It will be really interesting to see how Kopecky will play a group with her, Georgie, Shabby maybe, Brand, Voss, with teammates behind. And maybe even Bastianelli makes it. I don't know. And that SD Works team might not be as strong. I, I'm really – the Roycer is the big – because if you're SD Works and you bring Roycer, it's so obvious what you do. Mm. Yeah, you just anticipate with her in the first third of the cobbled se sectors before 
um, the first five-star sector, get her ahead. She can ride her own pace with maybe one other rider. And then you just, Trek don't <laughs> Trek don't have Ellen Van Dyke. Like, what can they do? Vo- Yamo Visma don't have a strong team either, and nor do who else did I mention? Oh, like, it'll, it'll probably be Canyon Shram trying to control Royce with uh, Skalniak, who's a good rider, but she's not going to bring her back. So yeah. maybe they use Madras in that role. It's. It's definitely a possibility. They can use Majors in that role. Last year, she was strong in the race, but I feel like it was interesting. Like, Kopecky was both working for Vandenberg Black and Majors, who are both the leaders, according to Kopecky, in her after-race interview last year, which, in my head, was completely stupid. But, like, it wouldn't shock me that Majors, once again, plays a really good role for that team, though, because the year before, she was once again really strong in yeah. this race. Two. Now, there's other teams that can do stuff here. Bastianelli, Consoni at UAE. I don't really know what a Consoni can do on this train. I don't remember her performances at this race in the last two years, but a Bastianelli can do can do loads of stuff. She's a she's a real animal on cobbles, that's for certain. Confonieri and Didrikson, those are top 10 riders for UNOX. They'll want to get as many points as possible. And you might see a scenario where UNOX just keeps riding with a certain other rider because they want to get as high as possible in terms of UCI points, even if it reduces their chances of a podium or a victory. But Chabi as well on Canyon is one that did really well last year, but isn't necessarily this year popping in my head as like, ooh, she looks really strong right now. So I'm not sure that will display here. But once again, different beast, eh? Roubaix cobbles versus, versus RVV cobbles. These are the ones that make a true difference, but... With, with these last two years being an early move that actually makes it happen, I'd find it intriguing if SD Works makes an early move because then on paper, the other teams are the ones that are put in danger and not SD Works. And the question is then, who does these outsider teams send with the SD Works right at attacks? Because that's how to kill SD Works, right? Yeah, the way that then, if they, for example, Yastrap yes. go with with Majerus, and that's a yeah. problem for ST Works. Yeah, exactly. That's a scenario I'd be looking for if I was a DSM and so forth. But again, Georgie, hundred percent top three favorite of this race. Sharon Van Anroy, she's been outstanding this season. Top ten in Flanders and Dwarz Tour, just twenty one years old. Be looking for her to get a big result. Maybe the. Maybe the Trek team is stronger than I think, and the lack of hills really equalized this, as we've been saying. We've mm-hmm. also got Jaco Alula, who don't have a confirmed team yet, but I would expect uh, Roseman Gannon, Paternoster, Georgie Howe, Jessica Allen to be in the team at least, and maybe Amber Pate. She just did Shoulder yep. Price, and Tineal Campbell, who did her first race of the year at Shoulder Price. They've got Georgie Howe, she is her first year on Jayco. She was a rower, I think. Um, so if there was any race, she finished a lot of the classics. If there was a race that was going to suit her, it would be Roubaix without, with the lack of hills. So keen to see how she goes, maybe a top 10. Um, but yeah, time for picks, Benji. I'm going with five for Georgie first, Lotta Kopecky yeah. second, Sharon Van Anroy third. I, uh, I love your Georgie pick. I'm jealous of your Georgie pick. I'm going to go for Kopecky first, Georgie second. And uh, no, I'm going to switch around. Kopecky first, Brunt second, Georgie third. Yeah, I think Brunt is probably more realistically to podium than Van Anroy, but I wanted to give some props to the young rider doing well. Yeah. But yeah, I'd love to see everyone, you know, SD works great, they invest in the sport, but Love to see an upset. <laughs> like from a, it would be great to see you know this race be yeah. tight, and that's I think what we're hoping for. If Kopecky rides away on the third cobble sector and is never seen again, it's not um, it's not the most intriguing. So that's yeah. what we're hoping for, and I think we've convinced ourselves during this preview that Trek DSM and Co can stick it to SD Works if they play their cards right, and if SD Works do what they did last year. would love to see it. But that's our Paribay Famavec Zwift preview. We hope you enjoyed it. Let us know in the comments down below who you think will win the women's race or podium the women's and men's race. We'll be watching Wall to Wall on Saturday and Sunday on GCN+. And until Saturday's recap, ciao.